will say, I know the gospel is about Jesus, about his character, his life, his death, burial, and resurrection. That his work is for us, okay? On my behalf. It's very personal for us. But what about the Holy Spirit? We'll talk about that today a little bit. I'd like to have you turn with me to our scripture reading this morning. John chapter 16. This uh, passage bears a lot of repetition. John 16 verses 13 to 15. John 16 verses 13 to 15. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself. I want to focus in on that little phrase. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Who's speaking here? Jesus is speaking, right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it to you. The Holy Spirit is the great shower. He's the great shower of Jesus, right? We need that. We wouldn't know anything about what Jesus did were it not for the Holy Spirit. And my message today uh, stands or falls on this simple premise, he shall not speak of himself. That the Holy Spirit, this means that the Holy Spirit will not draw attention to himself. This simple statement is very, really profound. The entire ministry of the Spirit is away from himself. All endeavors by humans to place the Holy Spirit at the center of attention is a clever plan by the devil to take our eyes off of Jesus. It works contrary to the Holy Spirit's work. But he's there to show us Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the great shower. There is a biblical order of salvation which places the work of Christ in the office of Savior. Christ is Savior. And the Holy Spirit is the shower of Jesus. The reformers of the 15th and 16th centuries uh, called it the ordo solus, the order of salvation. Our message from the Bible is to take our eyes off the subjective situation that we have and look where? Look to Jesus. Uh, innocence here. It's not about us, right? And the Holy Spirit is teaching us to turn our eyes somewhere else, heavenward. The Holy Spirit is the one who facilitates our gaze upon the Savior. We are saved by looking like the serpent in the wilderness. They were told to look and live because all around them were the dead and the dying who had been bitten by the snakes. If the Holy Spirit is seen in a different role than this, and our eyes are turned to the work of the Holy Spirit that he does in us, we might call it the Spirit-filled life, or our Spirit-led accomplishments. If it's turned that direction, away from Jesus, there's a danger that we focus on our experience and take our eyes off of the Lord. In Luther's day, the purest gospel was being uncovered. Luther spoke uh, to of the enthusiasts who were gathering up all around them. They were crying, the Spirit, the Spirit, and they were talking about their wonderful experience in the Spirit. And Luther rebuked them in the strongest terms because it took the focus off of the gospel, which the Holy Spirit sought to facilitate. Those uh, extreme unbiblical ideas are the basis for the charismatic movement and the tongue movement and the spiritualistic movement, which began in the early 1800s and really continues on to our day. This all works against the Holy Spirit who seeks to speak of Jesus. Someone will say, well, And I've heard this already, and you probably have too. I'm a spirit-filled believer. Or I want to tell you about my experience in the Holy Spirit. 
Others write in detail about how the Holy Spirit gives them marvelous sensations or revelations. One said, right down to the balls of my feet. Can anyone imagine the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost proclaiming in his sermon something like this? Can you imagine this? Men and brethren, I have just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you how really wonderful an experience it is. When the Holy Spirit came upon me, it was like having an electronic per, electric current passing through me. I felt such wonderful love and peace uh, through my entire body. Can you imagine Peter preaching that on the day of Pentecost? Or the other apostle saying a thing like that? On the contrary, that's not how it was on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit was fully come, they weren't talking about a wonderful experience they had in the, in the, in the Spirit. And the first century, nothing, in that, nothing like that even in the first century church, the book of Acts, where it's all talked about. When Holy Spirit energized the apostles to preach, he made no reference of himself or to his feelings. His message, the very substance of the message was Jesus Christ. His victorious life, his death, his resurrection. And really, that's what the gospel is. And it went to the whole world in one generation. It's an amazing thing. You read in Colossians chapter 1, it says the gospel has been taken to every creature under heaven. And that was within 30 or 40 years after Jesus had gone back to heaven. Wow. And the Holy Spirit gave them power of utterance. Here's how it really sounded. Let's turn to Acts. I'd like to invite you to turn to Acts. Chapter 2, 22 to 24. Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. Verse 22 to 24. Here's what he said. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He points him to the, the doing and suffering of Jesus. Uh, we pass down just a few more verses here, down to verses 38 to 41. Then Peter said unto them, Repent ye, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of who? Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children and all that are far off. By the way, who might that be? All those that are far off. That's 2,000 years ago when he did this. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he did testify and exhort concerning, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's how it was on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> the great affirmation of the apostles in the first century and the sermons they preached was the gospel of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit provided the behind-the-scenes power for that proclamation every day. He shall not speak of himself, but will take the things of Christ and Show them to you, the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Godhead, takes his energy to uplift Jesus to us. This does not mean that the Holy Spirit is any less divine personage than was Jesus himself. But notice the humility here in the Holy Spirit. He's not speaking of himself, but he's always pointing his finger, pointing for us to the Savior. That has a total, total that, that might seem to us like a totally different, lesser role. But in the plan of salvation, there is an order. The Holy Spirit takes the role of facilitating our love for Jesus. Oh, how unselfish and untiring the Holy Spirit is to us every day. The holy angels assist the Holy Spirit in this grand work of ministering to us the vital work of making Jesus known and planting faith in our hearts. The Bible says of the angels, are they, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them, those who would be heirs of salvation? 
Oh, how tireless. Those special assistants to the Holy Spirit making Jesus known to us every day. Ministering for those who would be heirs of salvation. I'd like to just uh, do a little diversion here in Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah is actually a very interesting book to spend some time with, uh, studiously with a commentary. But uh, in chapter 1 of Zechariah, if you could turn to that with me, verses 8 to 11, talking about the angels here. Horses here are symbols of angels. They're powerful. In the, in the ancient world, horses were the, powerful, were, the, were the power, right? Let's notice here verses 8 to 11. And I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were there, were there red horses speckled in white. Then said I, O Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Have you ever thought of the ministry of angels in your own personal life? Every day they're there to protect us and to guide us and to prompt us to turn to Jesus, okay, as the Holy Spirit does. Verse 11, And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth is still and is at rest. When the angels are there, everything is at rest and peaceful. Can be in our lives. These horses represent the powerful ministry of the angels. So what does all this mean? As we sit down with Jesus, with an open Bible, the Holy Spirit teaches us. He's our teacher. He's the greatest shower and teacher, the one who leads us into all truth. And when we are in trials, he's a comforter to us. As he shows us Jesus, the great healer of mind and body. When I am sad, what does the song say? He makes me glad. When I'm in sin, the Holy Spirit brings conviction and confession and repentance toward the Lord Jesus Christ. When I'm lazy or careless about sin, the Holy Spirit comes into my mind and empowers me to be obedient and to bring to me the, the sanctified life. It talks about that in 1 Peter 1 verse 3, the work of the Holy Spirit. He empowers me to be obedient to the law of Christ, to service and witness to others. I would like to turn to Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. A long time ago I looked at this text and I thought, you know, this is, this is the sanctified life. Bear ye one, a, one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? Where's the power for all these good things? Acts chapter 1 talks about the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit would fall, and this would give you power to witness. I think we've experienced some of this in this church. I've noticed that in the past weeks. I think over 120 different contacts have been made uh, from, from response we got from the community. What an idea. Uh, all this and much more is the role of the Holy Spirit in my life. The apostle did not turn the world upside down in the first century by telling people about their own spiritual exaltation, nor did they put their spiritual gifts on boast and, and display like some did in the, in the church at Corinth. Paul wrote to them about that. They were, they were reversing the order of salvation. Pride never runs so high as when it has a startling experience to relate, especially an exalted religious experience. You all know what Micah 6, 2, 6 8 has to say. Uh, mercy, right? There's no exaltation here, having mercy for other people. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul shows how repugnant it was to him to par par parade his own experiences as the charismatics in, the, in Corinth did. 
It was really a mild rebuke to Corinth. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, Jesus speaking, he shall glorify me. The unselfish Jesus to us, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He exalts Jesus to us. Both of them are unselfish, right? Can you think of a more unselfish thing than Jesus, the God of heaven, the creator God coming down to this world and uh, doing what he did for us? I'll tell you what, we'll not know what, he, what, what, what a great gift this is to us until we actually walk on the sea of glass and see what he left. So the Holy Spirit is totally unselfish. <laughs> he doesn't point to himself. He always points us to Jesus and Jesus, the great unselfish one also. The Holy Spirit's work in the plan of salvation is to make us Christ conscious. Here's the proper order of salvation. I want to kind of enlist it for you. Number one, the Father. The Father is the great facilitator of the plan of salvation. He gives and provides Jesus with his own fellowship and his encouragement to Jesus every day that he lived. In fact, he woke our Lord up in the morning so he could have communication with him. He didn't need an alarm clock. Tirelessly, the Father communicates with Jesus often and every day. And Jesus puts full trust and faith in his Father. You know, this is something that we can get a lesson from, right? <laughs> this wonderful connection that Jesus had with his Father can be ours as well. The Bible calls it the faith of Jesus. He puts his faith and trust and his Father in heaven every day. Secondly, the Son gives himself to us wholly until his, unself until his unselfish life is fully spent and he gives up that precious life for our sins. Oh, how unselfish Jesus is. We spoke a while ago of the unselfishness of the Holy Spirit and the unselfishness of the angels in their tireless work. Can you imagine what the job they have to do taking care of the likes of us every day. But Jesus gave himself not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world as he sheds his precious blood and his flesh is broken and pierced for us. I would like to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. This is a continuation of the conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. John chapter 3, starting with verse 14. We referred to this a little bit earlier. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so that was the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I hope that all of us here this morning see ourselves as a whosoever. Because this is really serious, especially in the times that we're living in. Thirdly, in the order of salvation is the Holy Spirit. His role is to glorify Jesus. To uplift Jesus to us. To make him known to us. To make his love, loving character known to us. And his unselfish sacrifice to us. So that we in turn can give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. As we begin to comprehend the wonderful plan, all we can do is give glory to him. Because just as the Holy Spirit's work is outward, so is our experience as we focus on Jesus and not on ourselves. We can all we can do is give glory to him as we eat and drink and live before our neighbors and those with whom we come in contact. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, had this idea in her mind. Let's notice from 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Give you time to find it. These are beautiful words. Hannah sang about this. Verses 17 and 18. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 
I'm sorry, it's not 17 and 18, it's, it's verse 1 and verse 7 and 8. Okay. Hannah's prayer. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in, what does it say? Thy salvation. She's giving glory to God here. That's in the first angel's message. And now verses 7 and 8. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifteth the beggar out of the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. All the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. So here is the order of salvation that the reformer spoke of which the Bible presents so clearly to us. The Holy Spirit leads sinners outside of themselves by giving them faith in their hearts. Faith is always outward. We don't put faith in this, do we? Faith is always outward. It's outward looking. People are saved by faith. Christianity is the only faith religion in the world. And a good example of the outward look of faith is the experience that we referred to early of the experience in the desert where the fiery serpents came in among the people as they're there in the wilderness. And Moses was instructed to make a brazen serpent and put it high on a pole where all the people could see it. And they were bidden to look and live. The gospel is about an outward look to our Savior. Jesus spoke of that in John 3, verses 14 to 16, which we just read. It is the gospel. Jesus became sin for us. I used to wonder, well, why a brazen serpent representing Christ? But he actually became sin for us. He took it. He took what we have. Faith is like an eye. The eye of faith that looks outside of ourselves, lays hold of Christ and his righteousness. The Bible says... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The idea of righteousness takes the law seriously. It isn't merely salvation by faith, but it's righteousness by faith. One who really reveres the righteousness of Christ will never speak badly about the law of God. The Holy Spirit causes us to behold what God has done outside of ourselves in the person of Jesus Christ. The Spirit's work in justification is objective, meaning it's outside of me. This work that was done was done for us before we were ever born, (laughs) 2,000 years ago. And for those that lived long before that, it was for them as well. For the Lamb, Jesus is the Lamb slain from what? The foundation of the world. The work of reconciling us to what God has done for all people, the Holy Spirit pleads for sinners, with sinners, look and live. That's his work. Christ was born one of us. Born one of us, died, was risen for the sake of us all. And that's the gospel definition. That's the definition of the gospel. And it's it's, uh, one of the best places I don't have time to... Turn to it this morning, but at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, that is a description, of the, a definition of the gospel, a description of the gospel. It talks about the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and his ascension to heaven as our great high priest, our representative. Do you know that there is a representative man in the most holy place, and he knows all about us and still loves us? And in him we are justified believers if we'll not resist the Holy Spirit's work by planting faith in our hearts. And as each generation rolls along, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Without the Holy Spirit, we would never know or appreciate what Jesus did some 2,000 years ago. Um, Jesus spoke about the idea of the Holy Spirit. He said, you 
when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he said, you don't have it because why? You don't, you don't ask for it. What do you think we should be praying for in these days, these end time days of earth's history? Pray for the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, he will tell us of that timeless sacrifice. He will show it to us. Uh, it's a work that never needs to be repeated. It only, happened to have, hap, it only had to happen once in all of eternity that Jesus, the God of heaven, would come down here and offer a one time for all sacrifice on our behalf. The Holy Spirit comes along and teaches us from the word and speaks to our hearts and creates faith and love and hope and repentance in our hearts. And that's the inward work that's in us. The Bible calls it sanctification. It's the fruit of what the Spirit accomplishes in pointing us to Jesus that bears fruit. Romans 5, 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by, who can finish that? The Holy Spirit which is, who is given to us, right? We want love in our hearts for other people, right? How do we get it? It's planted in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Love in the heart is the power behind obedience. None of this is self-generated in us. This is the Spirit's work in us. First of all, he points us outside of ourselves to Jesus, and then the fruit of that is that we have a work that he does within us. Love, joy, peace, all those things. Faith, faith is born in our hearts as we hear the gospel. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This morning, I've been trying to say all this in as many different ways as I can. One of the reformers said it this way, and I'm going to quote now. Faith is the principal work of the Holy Spirit, to plant faith in our hearts. Perfect salvation is found in the person of Christ. Accordingly, that we may become partakers of salvation, he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. We would never know about what Jesus did, nor be convicted of his saving work on our behalf if it were not for the Holy Spirit. It's very well said. It's so biblically alive. The Spirit draws all men to Christ that we might be saved by faith in Christ's merit. There's no reason why people should not believe the gospel because the Holy Spirit is such a powerful teacher and preacher to us. To not believe is to resist the Holy Spirit. The unpardonable sin is the sin of unbelief. The Holy Spirit convicts, and when a person resists, he's resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. And this grieves the Holy Spirit because salvation is everything to the Holy Spirit. His work is to show us Jesus. The Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit's work is so important that to resist him is blasphemy and may even cause a person not to be forgiven in the end. The wages of sin is sins that are unforgiven. Do you know none of us would be here this morning if it were not for forgiveness? And the Holy Spirit is pointing us, pointing us constantly to the source of our forgiveness. I'd like to read from Matthew tw chapter 12 now. Matthew chapter 12, 31 to 33. Matthew 12, 31 to 33. It says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. How do we blaspheme the Holy Spirit? By not paying attention to his work, right? His unselfish work pointing us to Jesus again and again and again. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good, 
and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, and the tree is known by his fruit. Yes, the Holy Spirit either makes the tree good by listening to the Holy Spirit, or corrupt. Have you ever heard of sour grapes? Once in a while I go to the store and I get some grapes that look good, but I put them in my mouth and what happens? I can't eat them. (laughs) Oh, I wish I had been a little more careful, right? Sour grapes, in other words, no one can stand that taste. And uh, so listening to the Holy Spirit is how sweet fruit is born out in our lives. Oh, how merciful and how untiring the Holy Spirit is in trying to get us to look heavenward to the work of Jesus and give glory to him. That is the most dangerous position to be in. It silences the voice of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Bible in all this is central. The Bible is the bread that we eat. As we eat comes the thankfulness and rejoicing in God's wonderful salvation. You all know that text, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and they were unto me, what? The joy and rejoicing of my heart. Could we covenant together this morning to spend some time with Jesus in the Word every day on a regular time, uh, spending uh, some time so the Holy Spirit can work in what the Bible, work out what the Bible works in? Uh, The little book of Daniel, which spawned the Advent movement. Without an understanding of the book of Daniel, we wouldn't be here this morning. None of us would be here this morning. We might be good Baptists, good Methodists, Presbyterians. It was a a study of the book of Daniel that spawned the Advent movement, which in turn carries the everlasting gospel to the whole world under the power of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in relationship to the word is beautifully illustrated in the sanctuary. The seven lamps of fire, where were they in the ancient sanctuary? The seven lamps of fire, where were they? In the holy place, right? And right across The room from those seven lamps of fire was what? Table of showbread, okay? And what does the bread represent? The Bible, the Word. And the Holy Spirit in those lamps illuminates the Word and gives us understanding of the Word. Beautifully illustrated in the sanctuary. And as we sit down with Jesus and open words and open his words to us, the Holy Spirit casts light upon those, upon that Word. And, uh, He plants faith and truth in our hearts. So then faith cometh by what? Hearing by the word of God. The Holy Spirit never works apart from the word, unless it might be a situation where nobody has access to the word, right? Normally we get our inspiration from where? The word as the Holy Spirit teaches us and fills our minds with love for Jesus. In this work of the Holy Spirit is the process of making Jesus known to me as a personal savior. Notice what he does. Jeremiah has it so beautifully worded. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. This is one that I would recommend. It's one you'll use again and again as you give Bible studies. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Let's take all the comfort we can out of this. Jeremiah 24, verse 7. Here's what it says. And I will give them a heart to what? Know me. Isn't that neat? I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return unto me with their whole heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I will give them a heart to know me. It's outward looking. It's looking toward the Savior, where he is in the most holy place, our representative. One of us is there in heavenly places. And he bids us all to sit with him in heavenly places in Ephesians 6, 2. But who's the one who facilitates that? The Holy Spirit. He's the one who points. To know Jesus is to have everlasting life. It's, it's not so much what we know, it's, but it's who we know. I will give them a heart to what? Know me. You believe that? <laughs> yeah, we need to believe that. Then there is a very important warning to us all. 
The problem in the Old Testament is that people would not listen to God's prophets. Again and again. They would not hear and consequently they didn't have faith. Who inspired the prophets? Holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit never works apart from the Word or God's prophets. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's turn to this, this one. I'm skipping a few texts here this morning because we're just about done. But Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'd like to read from 22 to 29. Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 29. Verse 20, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which, was writ which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to, and to the blood of sprinkling, and that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall we, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. And now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but the heavens. We're living in that time. It isn't just around Mount Sinai, and where all the, where all the commotion took place on that mountain that day. So violent was that, was that shaking in, on Mount Sinai that Moses coming down off the mountain and his face couldn't even be looked at by people. It's going to be more than that now. Notice verse 27. And this word, yet once more, signifying the moving of those things that are shaken as those things that are made, that those things that which cannot be shaken may remain. I remember a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy that says, Are the people of God so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses. One of these days, this, their deceptions are going to be so great um, that uh, we need to be real well grounded in the word. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a what? Is a consuming fire. Okay. Who lives in the, in the everlasting burnings, by the way, anyway? You can read about it in Isaiah 33. It's those who are righteous, right? They're the only ones that can live forever in the everlasting burnings. The devil kind of had it wrong. He said those that are wicked are going to be burning, 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 burning for millions of years. That's not how it is at all. They'll be as though they never were. But those who are righteous will live in the everlasting burnings. He knew more than anyone else what it was like to walk up and down in the coals of the fire that was in heaven around the throne. And he's deceived a whole world of people. So, uh, allow him to show us Jesus as we study and hear his word, that we allow the Holy Spirit to give us a heart to know him and love him, which is to obey him. To know Jesus is to love him. To love him is to obey him. Jesus once said, if you love me, what? Keep my command. It's just as simple as that. The Holy Spirit provides the horsepower with which we can obey him. The Holy Spirit plants faith in our hearts, and faith brings a strong love for Jesus. There are many things in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy which are the works of the prophets that we may not be following in our lives because we don't know about it. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to plant faith in our hearts 
Unless we study these things, we'll never learn to obey Jesus totally in our Sabbath keeping or in our healthful living. Ideas about evangelism and child rearing, relationship to country. It's a big thing right now, isn't it? Relationship to country. A whole host of other things, and above all, that we stay in the faith. The Bible says that he endure, that endureth to the end shall be what? Saved. You know, it says that at least two places in the Bible. <laughs> I think it's for repetition. It's found in Matthew 10, verse 22, but also in Matthew 24, verse 13. Very close together, where Jesus is talking about the end time. And uh, so it says, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So uh, I want to leave you with this. Literally, uh, we can look at that wonderful result of the plan of salvation in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. I'd like to have you turn to that. I think almost all of you can, can probably quote it. The Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation 14, 12. This comes right on the heel of the three angel messages which we have to carry to the world. Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the what? Faith, faith of Jesus. Where does the faith of Jesus come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit, right? He plants faith in, his, in our hearts as we spend our time studying his word. You know, this literally reads this way. Here is the steadfast endurance of the holy ones. Here's the patience of the saints. Here's the steadfast endurance of the holy ones. Those who keep the commandments of God. And uh, so may this be central, our central concern until Jesus comes in power and glory. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for Holy Spirit, for that wonderful gift that you left with us. May we not grieve him, but may we listen to that still, small voice each day, pointing us to the Lord Jesus so that we be sure of our salvation. I pray, Father, that you'll be with each one here today that have come here to worship you. I pray, Lord, that each will go home with a blessing that you give through your spirit. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.